to the the people from the next presentation. So, so Saxonica via, via John Lumley. Is that one still on? Can you hear me? Yes, you can hear me. That's one. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Try. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Bring it up. Bit higher. No, yeah, fine. that's fine. That, that, seem, that seems to... No, it's fine. Okay. It's like a laser beam, right? Right. Okay. That's right. You can hear me now. Okay. So next talk is about XPath in the browser. So it's in the long series of X something in the browser. We have we have had X query, X SLT, and uh, any other X thing in the browser. So now it's about, I think, the last edition of XPath in the browser. Thank you, John. I'm going to talk today about That's not my fault. All right, that's, that sounds a bit better. Okay. A simple execution plan for an XPath need to do. During your talking. Okay. It's dependent on where I'm standing with respect to. You want to use different mic? Okay. Sorry about this. Right, let's switch on. Okay. Okay, fine. Right. Can you hear me? Can you hear me now? Yep. Okay, that's better. Right, off we go. Uh, I'm going to talk about the context. I'm going to talk about parsing the X path and then the whole issue of converting that to Saxon JS instructions. Then I'm going to talk about the development methodology, the testing and the results, and you're going to see some demonstrations, and I'll draw some conclusions. It is terrifying to think that XPath is nearly 20 years old. Um, there's nobody in this room who wasn't born then, but large numbers wouldn't have started coding. Uh, we saw in 1999 an XPath 1 from the merge from XSL and XPointer. And in those halcyon days, the uh, um, developers of browsers put that in, in XSL T1 into the browser. However, uh, as we all know, that's being killed off by those idiots who wanted to do things like look at Facebook or Twitter on mobile phones. Uh, so. In recent times, because that uh, feature has been dropping from some of the browsers, people have looked, a number of people looked at JavaScript native implementations. Right. The XPath, the X family that was going to end up in the client, uh, fled that habitat to the much more gemütlich um, lands of server side. And we then carried on working over the next eight years and eight years on the increasing the standards to get to an XSLT to an XQuery level with XPath 2.0 in 2007. And again, people have done some JavaScript native work on that. Uh, of some particular note, um, Mike Kay, uh, Phil Fear, and, and uh, O'Neill Delprat in 2011 worked on a cross compilation of the um, cut down Saxon to produce, um, uh, using Google technology to produce a JavaScript. Um, compiler and run, and that became Saxon CE. A number of you have used it. Uh, we used to use it in Saxonica for the uh, documentation of the website. And the website. It's, um, 
it was really a uh, tour de force, but it required an awful amount of um, tending to keep it going. It was extremely dependent upon uh, the development tools, which were completely outside our control. And uh, eventually, it was um, put out to open, um, open source pastures. At the same time, we moved on into XPath 3. And, that's in, and Mike will tell you more about all that um, situation tomorrow. Um, and last year, he, or around last Christmas, he started working on some stuff, which then Debbie Lockett's been working on him with, which we call Saxon JS. And Saxon JS went to its 1.0 release on Tuesday. Or was it Wednesday? Tuesday, oh, Tuesday it was. Um, and that takes a different um, approach. It does a server-side, or effectively server-side, compile uh, on, of an XSLT in Saxon, using Saxon EE, and then it has a JavaScript client base, or JavaScript execution area engine that runs in the client. And that basically, uh, that's the thing we're based on, the, this works based on. Now, this isn't a talk about Saxon JS, but you can talk to uh, myself or Mike or Debbie or O'Neill. We'd be very happy to see what you're using it for. Uh, but you need to know something about how it works. Normally, you take an XSLT3, you put it into Saxon, whether you've got a licensed product or an open source or you're sitting in oxygen, and you, it creates a transform and you take XML in to produce XML out. However, Saxon EE can also be used to produce a style sheet um, export file, an SEF. It's an execution plan that's written in XML, and it's the execution plan of effectively the final end stage of uh, a Saxon PEE level of um, optimization. So it's had all its type checking, everything is done um, in that place. And then, you can take a browser, and you can take a web page which points, uh, which loads in a thing called Saxon JS, which is JavaScript, about 220 kilobytes minimized, and <coughs> you can then execute Saxon JS dot transform with a number of arguments, one of which is, points to that um, style sheet export file. And it then effectively interprets the instructions that it finds, which includes things like um, templates and uh, sets of templates, and ge sequence generators, all sorts of things. And then you get, uh, sorry, then you get effectively XSLT3 in the browser. And it actually has the same um, interactive features that were, if it were developed originally for Saxon CE. So you have interactive Saxon uh, 3 at very high levels of conformance indeed. There are some things it doesn't do, and I'll explain that in a second. Oh, and one thing I, sorry, I really should emphasize, Saxon JS is an execution engine for SEF instructions, and it does nothing else. So you're on your own, and that becomes important. Let's have a look a little bit of what the style, style sheet ex, um, export file looks like. This is effectively a tiny little bit of XPath. It's actually a repeater watch. It goes bong for every hour and ding for every quarter. And it's written as a, nest, a set of a let with three variables defined. And the SEF for that is effectively um, a piece of XML. It's actually a tree, which we rep represent as XML, and, and obviously, of course. Um, and we've done various things here. We've canonicalized um, the lets are now all nested. And in fact, it's effective in a set of nested functions if equivalent to operators. We've done things like allocate variable slots. We've also done some type determination to determine that the arithmetic happens, has to happen in the integer space rather than something else. And this is the sequence generator for that with a function call. Um, an if statement has been canonicalized into a choose, so we only have one choose in there. And we've done some other stuff on type inferred casting. Now, the features of uh, Saxon JS is it handles a very large amount of XSLT3, and it certainly handles new XDM types of map and array and JSON, and a large po um, po portion of the population of the 3.1 functions and operator set. In fact, um, uh, surprisingly, you find, oh, actually, it does that one. Okay. 
but it does have its limitations. Uh, it doesn't do streaming. Life's complicated enough as it is, and anybody wants to try doing streaming in the, uh, in the browser, you're welcome to it. Uh, it doesn't do packaging, because in one sense, packaging is a compile time operation, and you can use Saxon JS to package the pieces together. And in fact, the, origin, the style sheet export file was originally developed and is used as the means for link editing packages together in Saxon space. It doesn't have it accumulates, accumulators. And for the particular purposes of this talk, it doesn't in, or didn't implement the XSL evaluate instruction, because let me emphasize again, in Saxon JS, there is no XPath compiler, and there's no XPath parser even. Okay. But, and the, this is not a limitation, but it's an absolute requirement. Saxon JS is small and fast because it requires the execution plan to be very correct. Um, it is not going to check function arg uh, arity, uh, argument arities or their types. It is not going to even or it's not going to do the same for m almost all operators. It is assuming that things like when there's a cast required for most things, a cast instruction has been generated to the appropriate piece or a dynamic type check instruction has been put in place. And if you don't have that, it will run wrong. And the, the worst thing that we Saxonic can never have is something that wrongs wrong. It's far worse than running slow. Okay, so what I'm trying to do is to take a main process where I've got an XPath expression. I'm going to parse it and reduce it to a minimal XPath tree. I'm then going to take that minimal XPath tree and add some static context, namespace bindings, par parameters that are already loaded, effective, or available, and compile it into a style sheet export file. I'm doing this in the browser. It isn't actually a file in this particular case. It's just an in, in, um, in memory uh, data structure, actually a DOM tree at the moment. And then we pass that one with some dynamic context, what the context item is, and the actual bindings of the variable values put in the appropriate slots. And we get some results out. In this case, we get a result sequence. Now, um, this piece here, this piece here is Saxon JS, and that's fine. It just works as it normally does. This part up here, sorry. Uh, is Saxon JS XPath. It's 166 megabyte, uh, kilobytes, megabytes, kilobytes minimized, uh, which means it's the same sort of order of size as Saxon JS itself. Uh, it's actually dynamically loaded. If you ask for any of the valuation things the first time, it will actually pull it in from the, from the library from where the Saxon JS came from. So you don't, it doesn't cause you anything if you're not going to use it, and it only loads up once. And that's what I'm talking about here. Right. <coughs> In Saxon, uh, normally, the XPath parser is actually built in. It's a um, specific one, one that's been written. Uh, it does actually does certain forms of uh, change as, it, as that goes on. Uh, in this particular case, we, we could have rewritten, but we actually chose to use the, X, uh, the EBNF and Gunter Rademacher's excellent RESP generator, parser generator, which we use quite a lot, to produce a parse um, JavaScript which uses a number of callbacks in terms of starting and ending terminals and things like that. And we use those at the moment to generate an XML parse tree of all the productions of the, this particular piece. And of course, if, it's a, if it doesn't meet the grammar, it'll error out and we'll have an error in this particular case. The problem is uh, that these trees are very deep um, and this is something that uh, Steve Pemberton's talked about in Invisible XML, and um, he may talk about tomorrow again, I think. Um, but only a fraction of this is really of semantic importance. So what we do is reduce the tree. Um, we basically take this tree and bring it down to here. This tree's probably more than 27 levels deep, actually. Um, and the sort of things we do is we take tokens that are effectively are parameters of an operation, like the star, it says it, it's a multiply rather than a divide, uh, get in, thrown into attributes. Uh, we do the important one of single child reduction. If you've got a, an element which only has one child, the default case is to punch through and just keep on reducing below you. Um, we remove redundant tokens. 
and we also do canonical nesting, uh, nesting. So that let, for example, would be a single let with three let bindings. We actually take it so it's a binary tree of nested lets, which means the next stages are all dealing with canonical forms. They never have to check. They always know that they've got a binary, binary pair to deal with, or whatever it happens to be. Now, now we've got this tree, we get to the hard work, which is to generate the execution plan. We have some term with two operands, and we have some static context. What are the bindings on variables? What are the namespace prefixes that are appropriate? And the big thing is a clash between the argument types that come up from, the, uh, from underneath and the required type that comes from below. And um, if we take, for example, this case, suppose this operation here was salary minus 1,000. Uh, well, salary in XPath is actually a, no, a node element lookup short form, and the right-hand side is an integer. Um, uh, but the operator is effectively an arithmetic one working in the integer space. Actually, it assumes numeric. Okay. So what happens here is that Im implicitly you have to put an atomization operation in. In fact, it's a little bit more than that. You actually have to do a, um, a cardinality check and everything else dynamically on. And that's got to be done. Uh, similarly, we've got things where the context type is important as to whether or not there's an error that's coming on here. And some operations, like the for each, the left-hand tree builds pieces the ty of type which go down the right, become the context tree for the right-hand side. So in that particular case, we might have some rather more complex piece here. Or in fact, we might find that actually there's an error. And then once we've done that, we've got effectively that instruction tree. It has its type and recursively it just goes on. Now, what I've done, uh, I wrote this uh, in, uh, it's about six, the old, whole thing is about 6,000 lines of JavaScript. This is about, this part's about three, three and a half thousand. It's actually 22 major classes of different pieces. I could have possibly done it as objects things, but I think I learned a lot more doing it this particular way. Now, and this is ex uh, an example of it. This is where we're basically taking the range expression and making a two in instruction. Most of the, um, Saxon JS instructions are in reasonable one-to-one -one correspondence with one of the productions in the XPath space. Um, a large number of them are actually. So what we're going to do is make a t um, we're going to make an element two. We're going to uh, recursively process the left hand and the right hand sides. Um, we're going to then form up some diagnostic information, which we'll use if we need to write runtime diagnostic information. We're then going to do um, add a child, which is the result of this most important thing, the type check. Because what we're saying here is the left-hand side is required to have a type of, of optional integer. Um, and I'll, come, I'll talk more about that in a second. And we do the same for the right-hand side. And then we've finished that. We've got a, a set type, because we know the type of this node is actually an integer sequence. So that goes back up into the recursive space. I'm doing that's fine. Okay, um, the, this type check has a number of different requirements. Well, first of all, it's a critical component. In fact, if you looked at Sax, something like Saxon G, this particular piece is probably one of the three or four most critical components in the whole thing. If this goes wrong, you start getting wrong results wholesale. It's required to, to first of all, detect semantic type errors where this cannot possibly work. Or this can work if there's a, um, a uh, cast which is re uh, possible across this piece. Or this could work provided this runtime thing is in the following sort of cast, which case we put type checking instructions. And the way I wrote this one, originally I started writing it by hand, and then I got a bit further and then looked, and then I took the Java class type checker and transcribed it into JavaScript. And actually, a lot of it looks absolutely identical. Lots of the state. It's, it's a good thing that they both have semicolon as the um, statement separator. Oh, so they use that. And with a lot of the operators, we know what, what function, uh, what type we need for the operands. But we also need to deal with functions. And a function call is in Saxon JS is basically a function and call instruction whose parameter is the name of the function and whose children are the arguments of that function. 
So in order to type check this, we actually require the function catalog. So we generate it from the W3C spec as a signature RRT, et cetera. And we use that as part of our process to check that the calls are correct, the RRT is right, and they're necessarily, uh, the types are either fail or they've got a cast or they're correct or whatever it happens to be. And I you want to make, stress this again. You sort of get, you put the wrong number of arguments in here, two men. Saxon JS is not going to try and check that. It's just going to go, it'll probably, the if you haven't got an argument supposed to be there, it'll assume it's null, probably might be considered to be the empty sequence, but it's all part of making Saxon JS lightweight and fast. Okay. Some things that in the um, XPath space that are look like function calls actually in one sense aren't. They're type constructors, and we convert those to cast instructions. And there are some others where there are some implicit casting, um, particularly where there's a default argument. So for example, the string length uh, without any argument actually requires string length of a stringification of the, of the context item. Uh, variables, very similar system. Um, they're either invocation parameters for the expression, or they're the subject of a let. We add them to the static context of definition. Uh, we allocate slots for them. We infer their type by looking at their generator tree. Uh, and then their scope is the normal scope, and the tree scope, it all works quite nicely. And they interpolate through varref, and we can do type and slot reference from there. Now, how do you develop such stuff? So I have an XPath expression 1 to 10. Um, I've parsed it, and I look at what that parse is, and one of the systems you'll see in a, in a second is we can see all these trees and serialize them out. It's been extremely important. And then we can compile it to the SEF, and we can probably run it and see whether it works. But actually, in developing it, I need to know what these things look like. So uh, we could appeal to the Oracle, but it's, it's not really fair to keep asking Mike every three or four minutes about something. Uh, yeah. So uh, we use something he prepared earlier. Uh, we use XSLT3. We load that XPath expression into a minimal one, push it through Saxon EE, and look what's SEF produced. Uh, so that gives us a hint about what these things mean and how they're doing. And it's actually a very nice way of doing things. A few other things we put, we actually put, specifically put uh, determined types on these trees so we can check that sort of thing as well. And that's what we did. Okay. And we use, I still use that to this day occasionally to go back and look, what did Saxon EE make of this one? Uh, what the hell's that thing? You know, why, is, why those flags mean and that sort of stuff? And then I go back and look at the Java to try and find out what's going on. Okay, but that's not adequate to test this system. You can do it, you can produce test bits and pieces, that's fine. But to get it x -paths, you've got to test it. Our forefathers are for us basically spent a lot of time putting together up to 30,000 tests for XPath in the QT3 test suite, uh, which the catalog is a bit of XML, and it produces a whole lot of tests. It has a lot of tests. Here's a simple one, which is effectively checking that if you do uh, concatenate in the presence of arithmetic bits and pieces, it's going to do it correctly, string concatenate, it's going to do it correctly. Um, so we could, normally in Saxon, we have a Java test harness to deal with this one, but we can produce a piece of XSLT which takes, reads all that in, takes the test, um, and passes the XPath to an evaluate instruction, evaluate it, get the result, and then check the assertions that we've got. Um, and we could normally run that as a piece of just straight XLLT. But we can also compile it to an SEF, and then we can link that to a web page and run the entirety of the QT3 test suite in the browser itself. Okay. And that's what we've done. And, for, and there are classes that we don't deal with. There are features that we don't support and that sort of stuff. There are about 18,500 we actually run. And for Chrome, we can do that. Uh, we get a, at currently is about 115 failures. Uh, there are 173 that fail but get the wrong error. Um, and it takes about two and a, uh, just under three minutes on this laptop, which is pretty good performance, actually. 
uh, comparison with what we do when we just run under normal Java, Java operations. So I'm going to show you what that looks like. Uh, this is it. Okay, here's Chrome. I'm going to load up my... Um, I'm just running it off a local, um, um, local server. This is at the top is some examples. Here's a case where we've got... Uh, let me make the thing a bit bigger. Okay, this is a piece where we've had an X path, and that was the uh, result of it, evaluating it. Um, this is an, another example where I've got the X path age plus 22, and this is what I, compiling, I compiled it to in terms of the instructions, and we checked that against what, what Saxon would do. But let me go back. Oh, I don't want to go that way. So now we have effectively read in all the QT3 tests. It's already been done now. Um, We've got some accepted features, but we've got a whole string of uh, categories. So I'm going to choose the mathematics categories. It's now loaded in. There are 149 tests in a number of categories there. Math, cause, sign, that sort of thing. So I'm going to select them all, and I'm going to say go. And it's now finished and run them all. And it's shown me that 144 and there are three errors, and let me show you what the errors looks like. Uh, they're all on math log 10, and they basically, the errors are the math log 10 of 1,000 has come back as 2.9999996, and it's ex expected to be equal to 3.0. So we've got those sort of little precision things, but it shows them and all done. And just to give you an idea that it does work reasonably well, I'm going to clear this down. I'm going to load up the operator set. Right, we've got 4,000 um, tests here, and it takes about 30 seconds. Um, and this has become really quite important. It's, it's the one way I test the uh, compiler that I'm doing, but it's also actually the only way we've probably got of really finding out inside the brow in the fully in the browser situation some of the real corner cases on Saxon JS um, runtime itself. We found things that weren't being weren't being sh uh, were different on different browsers, uh, which we weren't showing up on a Na NAS horn tests. So we've now finished these. That took what? Let thirty seconds. Twenty five. Fine. Um, so it's. Uh, we got four errors. Uh, one error that uh, I'll show you one down here. Where are we? Here we are. There we are. Uh, name equals, and it basically uh, said that the name uh, Q name equals to an a, a, any URI failed, and it's um, it was expecting an error case. This is a case where my type checking hasn't worked properly. I'm, I'm allowing it to try and do a comparison that it shouldn't be allowed to do. That's it. Right. Now, let's go back. Okay. So that's the testing there. However, and if we go on, um, all I did was load up the browser, and that was Chrome. I actually normally work in Firefox. Um, so if I want to try it in a different browser, I just literally fire it up with a different browser. And I don't, we can do it on all six. I haven't tried Vivaldi yet. But okay. Right, if we then take each of these pages and we save the page as HTML, and in uh, one case, in Safari case, it comes as a web archive, but we still know how to find the information inside that web archive. And then we write a piece of XSLT that looks and pulls all those in, and agglomerates, then we can produce an agglomerated result across the entire set of browsers about which, which, function, uh, which tests pass and fail um, under what sort of circumstances. And that's exactly what we've got here. This is effectively our um, browser comparison that I did on Monday. And here are effectively the pass and fail results that we had from the different browsers, and they actually change a little. Um, the, uh, we also get reports of what, what was accepted, what test cases were accepted and um, similarly. And we also have a very specific thing we can look at 
which f test failed and which under which browser under what sort of conditions. And it's really fascinating. There are of these 18,000 tests or so, there are only 104, 104 that every browser failed, and about another 100 that uh, some of the browsers failed on. Um, and it's become interest, very interesting to try to work out, why is this one working on that one, but not this one? And you, you, you can see things that come from the um, original genesis of the different browser, browser families, but some of them are a little weird, and we have to go on to that one. But lot, I should say, a lot of these errors are, are right at the extremes of some of the, ex, of the X paths or let, uh, um, cases. Right. Okay. Now, what I've been talking about so far has all been concerned with um, XS, um, XPath uh, in XSL evaluate circumstances. But if I put, a, put together all the information that's necessary for an evaluation um, outside of XSLT. And so we have a pure JavaScript API. And this is a bit which is trying to, as part of setting some clocks, it's a demonstration which is available on, uh, on the... Um, uh, Saxonic web website, and this is a piece which basically is executing an XPath to find every element of this doc which is uh, in class clock, and then for each of it, it's going to execute a set clock operation. And this is what it looks like, and I'll show you it running. Oh, sorry. That's it. Right, this is I'm going to run it up. Okay. And it's now started running. And we've got some clocks here that are digital in H HTML, XHTML, some clocks which are analog in SVG, and some clocks that are analog and digital in SVG. And the whole thing is written, I, um, is written in terms of finding out um, a classified piece, um, class classified pieces of time indicators and working if you if you're basically a piece of SVG and you're not a piece of text then we rotate you by the appropriate angle um, but if you are a piece of text then your text content gets replaced and that's all being you can see that um, information I can show you if you want to later um, and it's all it's about um, well actually why not, why not show you now uh, this is all the that's all the set clock but uh, it's got basically three, uh, three pieces of XPath that are being evaluated. And it's quite nice to see that uh, we put this up and announced it effectively on Tuesday. And by Wednesday morning, um, somebody had already um, pointed out that the, our date system was, um, uh, wasn't being converted backwards and forwards correctly. So it's nice to see. And I'd reiterate what Mike said earlier. We would love to, you know, myself or, Mike or Debbie's sitting over there, or O'Neill, we'd love to hear much more about what any of you who are using Saxon.js, because we'd like to find out more about it. OK. OK, the future. Well, apart from spending most of the next year uh, squashing bugs left, right, and center, actually, hopefully not too many, but we'll get there. Um, we could do some optimization. Um, one of the things that I would need to think about, um, this parse tree reduction e exercise is something we need to do. Uh, it's probably best if we can do something smarter in the callbacks. That might. There's no point in building up a huge DOM tree to then collapse, to then t make a small DOM tree by looking at it, if you can avoid doing that to start with. So that's one thing. We've got all the stuff about constant sub-expression -ex evaluation, the sort of thing that Saxon uh, um, itself does falling off a log. Uh, it's not done falling off a log here. And actually, unless you're going to do repeated stuff, it's probably not worth it. You probably may spend more time trying to work out whether you can do it than by doing it itself. Um, However, if you're doing it for repeated stuff, it's possible to think about splitting the compile and eval stage, which we couldn't do in JS API. It actually has a problem. The problem is that, remember this thing about uh, the execution plan must be correct. If you start splitting those two things and people putting in their own, their own execution plans, it's going to be uh, cause um, possibly some problems. Um, the paper on Saxon JS, uh, Debbie Lockett and Mike, uh, last year in Balisage, um, suggested a possibility that we might think about a um, JSON format for SEF. If that happened, then we could do the same thing inside the XPath. It wouldn't be 
the, um, a problem. Um, I originally wrote this, I wrote this compiler all in JavaScript. Uh, Mike had suggested one stage, why not do some of this in XLT, but I'm glad I've stuck doing this because I've learned a lot more. However, there is an argument for doing it in uh, XSLT in terms of, well, maybe simpler to, to read and see, uh, but it will also support the possibilities of um, uh, retargeting to another uh, another runtime environment, if, uh, rather runtime language if we ever got to that sort of stage. And in gray here, because it's a really murky area, uh, we've done the, a lot of the hard work, I wouldn't say all the hard work, a lot of the hard work of doing simple XSLT inside here. Uh, we've got to do a bit more for things like um, uh, pattern matching and that sort of stuff, but we've got a lot of the type checking in, so it's possible to think and consider doing a function transform support uh, in the browser, though whether it be anywhere near the levels of conformance we've got is another matter. So the conclusion of this talk, uh, if you have an instruction execution engine, then you can do um, uh, in-browser XPath evaluation, but there are four things you really must have. You must have an efficient and accurate XPath parser, early stuff that I did in various times using regular expressions can work for just the right sort of simple thing, but it doesn't take very much before that breaks wholesale. Uh, the first time is when somebody gives you a string with a dollar in it, you know, that sort of stuff. You must have very accurate type checking code. If you haven't got that, it's going to be really problematic. Well, you're going to get the wrong answers, that's the simplest way of putting it. You really should have an oracle to show you what the correct execution plans are, or it's very helpful. And you, in this particular case, you really need to get an, um, a test harness going in browser fairly soon. Um, it means that you can start to run lots and lots and lots of things and then find those, ah, that doesn't work in this particular case. And in conclusion, we have shown some very high conformance level levels for this and rapid execution speeds. Uh, it's available on our website, you can try it out, and uh, you can probably submit bug reports to us, but we're not going to do anything on them until next week. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, very interesting presentation, so I hope we have a few questions. I saw some remarks during the presentation on Twitter. Uh, so could you just sketch uh, what, why uh, there are the differences between the different browsers uh, in the number of successes and failures? Uh, yeah. The, it, it's... It recently, um, things... Um, they had different... Some of the reasons that we've fixed so far... A, a good example is... Um, file not fa parse, parse error on an XML when you're reading a document, okay? Uh, they all have different ways of doing it. They all have different results. So you actually then have to make sure your, your code can look at which different ways you want. You know, some, some of them will actually throw an error, okay? Which is really what you want. Others will, will helpfully return you a piece of XML which tells you where it was. So you now have to go and look to find out, is it one of those pieces? In which case, my document. It's that sort of little bit and piece that we have to deal with. And we, we'll start tracking them down a little bit more. A ver, uh, there's one that fascinates me, is why there are two of them that have 20... All right, there's a set of errors which are tests which work with excess float. Or why anybody would want to use excess float these days, I have no idea, but never mind. Um, and the access in our system, the float is shifted into, into Java double. So you get tests which are more precise than they should be, and we get failures, and we don't consider those to be proper failures, they're just you know, precision errors. Um, unfortunately, um, six, four of them have 49 of these failures, and two of them, but not the same family, Safari and one of the other, have 21. And I've still got to go and look at that in more detail. So, so the answer is, um, we'll nail these down a little bit, little bit closer. Um, yeah. Okay. Any other question? Okay. Well, I think you answer one question I had in the beginning was why you didn't do it in XSLT, but you answer it in the end. 
Would you, uh, yeah. yeah. It's, um, the XSLT actually will, will not be as fast. Yeah. Because what you're going to do is you're going to produce a style sheet ex export file of yeah. the XSLT that you are then going to run interpreted, yeah. interpreted in order to interpret one, t one tree and make another tree, which is going to be an S SEF that's going to be put in there. <laughs> and so you can, you can picture okay. the sort of picture in your head. It probably, I suspect, it'll be about um, maybe a factor of three or four, four slower. That would be an off the top of my head in terms okay. of that thing. The, the, as far as the speed is concerned, you've seen what, how long those tests took. It looks like each of those tests takes, on this machine takes of the order of uh, two, between two and five milliseconds. That sort of order. So uh, for normal interactive type stuff, you're probably all right. If you're going to be in very tight loop type animation situations, uh, then that's a different, different matter. But even in that particular case, you're probably, that's a particular case where you're not likely to be dealing with, um, uh, you're likely to be dealing with the same X path being repeatedly used. So you could actually think about compile once and run many, run many times. I Anything have else? a last question, oh. if there is no question. There's one. Then. Oh, there is one, okay. Well, uh, <coughs> I may be wrong, but it seems to me that you are very close to uh, doing an X-Forms evaluation. Am, am, am I right? Because it would be interesting. It's possible. I mean, it's not something... Uh, I've, I touched X-Forms in, in some work about... Oh, uh, where are we now? about eight or nine years ago, but I haven't touched it for, uh, since. So it's something, if anybody's interested in discussing that and looking at it, then get in contact us. If they've got, you know, what we'd like, the, the sort of thing that we love is to see a small test case that would allow us to look at something, things like that. Thank you. Last question, why don't you test nodes.js? Not JS. Because that's, I stay in the browser. That's, that's Debbie's. Um, uh, oh, okay. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> so now is the coffee break. So you can have uh, food at the first level or coffee with the sponsor information just over there. So see you in a few minutes. <laughs>